I need, I need some of the kids to come on up here. If, even if you think just you are a kid, go ahead, come on up. Where, where am I? There you go. I know I've got a few of them here. Yeah, come on up. All right. I need you to stand right up here. Here, we're going to move the, uh, the, this. There we go. Right up here in the front. Yep, get a, everybody wants to get a good look at you. Anybody else? Is that? Look at these guys. Isn't this great? Okay. How you doing? Great. You feel good about this? Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever talked to a lot of people, like a big group of people before? No. No? If you did, what would you say to them? I'd say. Here, here, let me, let's, let's set this up. Here, go ahead. Now you're leading. Go ahead. And God believes in us. So, first things first. Start with God and help God. Yeah. And do the thing he says. And you're doing great. So let's read. We'll give him an applause. We'll give you forgot to take offering. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know. What a great job. Good job, buddy. That was awesome. You always start with God. You start with God. I think that's a great, that's good advice. I don't know if, if I can do better with, than that. If you start with... Oh, he's not done. If you, if you start with... If you, if you start with yourself, he won't praise you. You have to start, start with God, and then he'll praise you. I love that. I like that idea. He did a great job. Perfect. Well, guys, I don't know. I guess we could. We're done. Um, okay, come on over here. Scooch over here, guys. Get, fill, fill in over here. All right. Now, there's a there's a game that we used to play, and it's called Simon Says. Do you know how this works? Does anybody know how this works? Can you? Okay. You don't know. Well, she's gonna explain it. Can you explain the rules? Oh, look at that. She's like, yeah, I know how we're doing. Come on. Yeah, then, then you're like, tell us how. <laughs> you know how? Okay. Um, Simon says something you do, and then he starts with Simon says, and then he says what you do. And if he doesn't say Simon says, then you're out, and you do it. Okay. All right. You guys got that? So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to, hey, Auntie Pants. All right. What we're going to do is, no, put it, yeah, hold, everybody's got to hold still. we got a hold still position. Ready? Hold st Simon says hold, you're all out. No, I'm kidding. All right, so Simon says hold still. I'm going to give you some instructions. You can only do the things after I say Simon says, all right? So if you do something and I don't say Simon says, then you got to go sit down. Okay, you ready? Simon says... Scratch your nose. You scratch your nose? Simon says, stop scratching your nose. That's ridiculous. Simon says, stand on one foot. Simon says, stand on the other foot. Ah! No, you're fine. Okay. Simon says, put your feet both on the ground. All right. Simon says, spin around twice. All right. All right. Put your hand in the air. Oh, come on. What happened? No, no, you did. I, judges, if you put your hand up, if you don't. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right, Simon says, jump up in the air. Come down. <laughs> You're all out. Go sit down. Good job. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Give him a hand, would you? Awesome, buddy. Ooh. All right, go, go sit down. You can go sit down now. Simon says you can go sit down now. All right, next week the adults are going to try this game. What a great bunch of kids. I tell you, this little guy, he, he may, we might have a preacher on our hands here. We've got to be careful. It would be nice to have one in this church. 
<laughs> oh boy. Uh, can we just take a moment just to stop, stop and pray and uh, ask God to prepare our hearts for, for his word. Heavenly Father, just we thank you for this day. Thank you for these kids. Um, just how your heart must be gladdened as ours is. Just looking at the, the smiles and the joy and the energy and uh, what a what a great blessing they are to our lives. And uh, Lord, help us to, to teach. Help us to not just impart knowledge, but help us to uh, protect their joy. Um, Lord, I just pray that you would be with us here this morning as we open your word. Help us to understand it. Give us ears to hear and, and eyes to see and hearts that are willing and open and receptive uh, to where you lead us. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, Simon says it's a fun game, uh, something that most of us have played at one point or, or another in our life. And it is simply a sort of follow me game. And the reason why I had these guys come up here and illustrate that for you, we have been teaching through the book of Psalms, kind of picking some spots here. Uh, and one of the things I love about Psalms is that it gives us this insight, this window into some of the emotion of, of a believer, of a, of a believer in God. Uh, the psalmist really gives a kind of an honest picture of some of the struggles. Not everything that he talks about uh, gives, paints this uh, glorified picture. There's, uh, there's some angst. There's some uh, uncertainty. There, there, there's, there's some pep talking that's going on. And so Psalms is a great book. Uh, to really help us kind of unpack a little bit of what the emotions of a believer um, are. So we can relate to it in a little bit. Every one of us has to deal with insecurities and issues and fears and doubts and feelings and all that stuff on a, on a regular basis. Some of us more than others maybe. Uh, but what I'd like to do is uh, the psalm that we're looking at today if you remember when you were in school or, or if you, you were in college and you had to take some classes, they always had different levels when you'd sign up for these classes. You'd have the, the 100 level classes, two, three, four, and as you graduate, um, you know, you'd be up into the 400 level classes. And so these, the 100 level classes, those were all kind of the basic uh, fundamentals of things. So if you were taking a 100 level class, usually as a freshman, uh, some people uh, as a senior just redoing it. I mean, they already got it, just kind of going back over it. Um, we're going to look at this, uh, the book of Psalms, but we're going to look at uh, Psalms 101. And the reason I like this psalm is because, psalm, is because it gives us kind of a different picture from some of the other ones that we've looked at. And here is uh, the psalmist kind of going in a, in a practical direction. So he's, you, you look at all of the emotions, you look at all of the energy and the feeling that he's put into so many of the other things, and you see this kind of switch go off in, in his mind, and he's like, you know what? God has done so much for me. He's, uh, this is his desire to respond. And so what he does here, in a sort of a basic, tangible, practical level, is he gives some specifics on how he, has, he is responding to God's kindness. Okay, so when you look at these statements, he has about 10 I will statements. So he's saying, God has done all this for me. God's kindness and his forgiveness and his grace and all of the things that he has poured into me, I need to respond. And so he's saying, as a believer, this is how I want my life to respond to God's goodness. Does that make sense? So this isn't just about a, a list of rules and regulations, some sort of, uh, you know, charter. This is about what does it look like when a believer responds to God's grace. All right? So let's look at these things. I want to read through here, and then we'll kind of go back. And I just want you to listen. I want you to listen to the heart of David here. And I want you to allow just God to speak to you, because there will be something in here that, that, that God's going to just kind of impress on you. I, I believe it. I, I know every time I've gone through this passage, he's, he's shown me something. So Psalms 101. I will sing of your love and justice. 
To you, O Lord, I will sing praise. I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? I will walk in my house with a blameless heart. I will set before my eyes no vile thing. The deeds of faithless men I hate. They will not cling to me. Men of perverse heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with evil. Whoever slanders his neighbor in secret, him will I put to silence. Whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, him will I not endure. My eyes will be on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. He whose walk is blameless will minister to me. No one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. Every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. So you have all of these statements that he's making, these I will statements. And he's simply framing what it's like to respond to a great God in a practical, tangible way from a believer's perspective. We talk about how do, you, how do you know God's will. The Bible is clear. It says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to the Lord. This is your spiritual act of worship so that you may then know what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. So if you want to know what God's will is, you can't do that while withholding obedience. Do you understand? You, you can't say, well, God, show me your will, and then I'll decide if I want to follow it. Are you tracking? You, you say, God, give me your plan, and I'll see if it fits with where I'm going. It first starts with surrender and obedience. If you want to know what God's will is for your life, if you want to know and be walking in his path, in the path of righteousness, it first starts with you wholeheartedly coming to him and surrendering to his will. To offer your, yourself as a living sacrifice. Say, God, here I am. I don't, I'm not sure where you're going to take me, what you're going to do with me, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm yours. Send me, direct me, lead me, guide me. It's all, it all belongs to you. That's how it starts. So people often say... <clears throat> You know, they want, <laughs> they want to enter into that plea bargain with God where it's just, it's not the way it works. And so here is David saying, this is, the, this is the result of someone who is surrendering their life to God. This is kind of what it begins to look like. What is the first thing that he mentions? The first thing that he mentions says, I will sing of your love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will sing praise. There is something that happens when we begin to take our focus off of ourself, our own in inadequacies, our own failures, our own struggles, our own, you know, achievements, and to begin looking at the greatness of God. When you make it a discipline in your life to praise the Lord, to sing his praises, Guys, there is a reason why we come to church and we sing songs, and we sing songs about God, because it has an effect on you and your spiritual life to actually open your mouth and sing praises to the Lord. It has an impact. We're not just going through motions here. You know, Alan, you know, as, as wonderful as he is as a musician, there's other things he could do with his time other than just get up here and sing some choruses. We have a fundamental belief that when we sing the praises of God, that scripture is true, that he inhabits the praises of his people. God's presence is drawn into our lives by our praises of him. Think about that. He says, draw near to me and I will draw near. How do you do that? Start praising him. You're like, well, I, I, you know, I, sometimes I sing in the shower, but people, you know, usually tell me to knock it off. I, you don't have to go around, what does it mean to sing God's praises? You don't have to go around just like 
you know, like auditioning for American Idol everywhere you go. You, you just singing God's praises, it's not just what goes on in your head, guys. There is something that happens when you take the praises that are going on in your head and you actually put them in your mouth and you go, blah. Get it out. My wife, this is, all right, Listen. I could be in trouble. Hang on. Here's what happens. There have been times, my, my wife is beautiful, you know, and, uh, you know, and here's the thing, I, I, uh, I, I don't know what she saw in me, but she, we got it figured out. I, I got lucky here. But here's the thing. She's gotten ready before and she's come out. You guys may not know this. Women enjoy it when, when you notice they've done something like combing their hair or putting on some war paint or whatever it is. When, it doesn't matter how long you've been around this woman. Every once in a while, you got to go, huh? You look good. I'm learning that. So, yeah. Because here's, a lot of times that happens in my head. And she'll walk by and I'm just like, Whoa. But if I don't say it, here's what will happen. <laughs> Some of you walked down this path, haven't you? You don't even notice that I curled my hair. Oh, is, oh you have hair. Okay. I thought it was especially curly today. And now you're trying to scramble in. You know, how much easier it would be if I just would say, when I have a thought of, of how wonderful she looks or something that she's done, in a relationship, it's clear that when you articulate things like that, it makes a difference. In your relationship to God, when you notice and you acknowledge things that he's done in the world, in your life, it begins to not only change your experience, but it glorifies God. And it's not enough just to have it going on in your head. Sometimes you need to get it out of your mouth. And you say, well, what does that look like? I just go around talking to myself about how wonderful God is. Here's what's great. However alone you feel, you're not. There are people around you all over the place. Look for ways that you can praise God to other people. Not only will it have an impact on you, it might have an impact on them. They might be feeling a total different direction. And all of a sudden you're like, well, isn't God great? Hasn't he, look, look at the sky. Look at what he's prepared for. Look at, a, look at the world that he's given. Look at this opportunity. Tell, give your testimony. Tell what God's doing in your life to someone else. And watch how that can change the trajectory of your whole thing. David says, I will sing of your love and your justice. I'm going to let it out. I'm going to tell people. I'm going to verbalize. I'm going to articulate your greatness every chance I get. Guys, it's a, it's a decision you can make. Start somewhere. Start saying it. Get it out. Praise the Lord. Verse 2, he says, I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me is the question. Okay, so... I would, I would do a show of hands here. How many of us are uh, leading a blameless life? I'm afraid that that would ruin it. So I'm not going to ask you. I know I, there's probably some of you are nailing it. You just right, right about blameless level. There is some anxiety that comes with this when I, when I read it because I think, yes, that is the, that's the objective. I want to live a blameless life. I want to, uh, to be in a position where... Um, you know, they're, they're, it's none of it's my fault. And then I re realized, you know, that's kind of the world we live in. Nothing's anybody's fault. Nobody takes ownership of it. <laughs> Nobody takes ownership. Don't blame me. So when I think about leading a blameless life, this is not about ignoring your responsibility and stuff. It's the exact opposite. It's actually living a life where you are sincere and have integrity in all the things that you're doing. In other words, you, you, the blame is not on you, not because you're dodging it, but because you have been consistent in your behaviors, in your actions, in your thought, word, and deed. 
So he asked the question, when will you come to me? Now, I don't get the, I don't, I don't have the, uh, the editor's notes here on this. I don't know what that question means. It could mean, God, when are you coming back? You could, you could present this in a way of, you know what, we need to be blameless because nobody knows the day or the hour in which the Lord's going to return. And you don't want him coming back and you're messing up everything. Right? Man, that'll... And then you'd be like, you know what? You don't know when your life might be taken from you. Don't leave here today without... You could go out into traffic and get hit by a bus. Be careful. You need to get your life right with God now. And I've heard that message and there has some pull. But what I, I think he's saying is there is this level of leading a blameless life that I cannot do simply by an act of my will. It doesn't matter how much I want to lead a blameless life. I blow it. So that, that means either I've got to be depressed and frustrated and full of anxious and a guilty conscience and just sorrow and my shoulders hang down and say, oh, I can't do it. I can't be blameless. What's the point? Or you say, God, draw near to me. God, when will you come to me? When will you fill my heart with your presence so that I can be the kind of man of God you want me to be? God, when will you come into my heart and make your home in my life by your spirit so that I can be led in the way that you are calling me to lead? Do you see what the difference is? Our, our blamelessness doesn't come from an act of our will or our work or our perfection. It comes from the work of God and his grace in our hearts transforming us to be what he's called us to be. So don't get, don't get down on yourself when you blow it. Man, that's the worst thing you can do. You ever see that in a, in a, in a baseball game? Somebody makes an error. L luckily, not on our softball team. We've got, I think, we have any errors this, this year, Joe? I, had I, I had three. Was that just the one game? Or were you looking at your line? Huh, what's that? <laughs> but you ever see that? Somebody makes an error, and then, like, it just tends to, it can snowball, you know, because they're, they're thinking about that, and then, you know, they, they miss something else, or something else happens. It's important to not get so focused on mistakes that, that you end up making more and end up getting more down. See, so many Christians, they're so bound up by guilt and so bound up by, by just the weight of blamelessness that they think they're supposed to be. And we are, by the way. God's called you to be holy. He wouldn't have called you that if he didn't think that that could be accomplished in you. So how does that, be, does that get accomplished because we just become better at following Jesus? The more you surrender to his will in your life, the more you allow his presence to fill your mind and your heart and your words, your actions change, guys, right? Don't we know this? It comes from the inside. You can't just try to change your actions hoping that your heart will, will catch up. Say, God, change my heart, change my mind, and then your behaviors will begin to follow that. Okay, so listen where he goes after this. He says, I will walk in my house, in my house with a blameless heart. One of the most difficult places to have a good witness is in your home, Right? These people see it all. They, they see you walk around in your underwear. It's, or, or maybe that's just my house. I don't know. Is it? They see everything. They see when you lose your temper. They see when you're frustrated. They see when, you know, all this stuff, your family and your home sometimes is the most difficult place to actually live a blameless life. But I love what he says. He says, they ought to know your heart. Your family, the people under your household, they ought to... They ought to understand your heart and where you're coming from because you've invested in them and that you've lived your life in a way that glorifies God in, in the best that you can. It, they're going to see all the mistakes and all the flaws and all this stuff. But he's like, my desire is to walk in my home with, the, with a testimony to my family of God's greatness. He says, I will set before my eyes... No vile thing. What you see 
becomes part of what you think, what you think becomes part of what you believe, what you believe takes its root in your heart, and it becomes the engine for your behavior. When he says, I will set no vile thing before my eyes, what he's saying is, I acknowledge that the stuff that I put, bef that I look at, the things that I put before my eyes, ends up taking root in my heart and in my behaviors. You guys, this is not about setting up some legalistic, you know, let's close the blinds, let's, let's block out all the windows, don't look, at, don't look at the world, don't see it. It's saying, I need to make some conscious decisions about the stuff I watch, the things I look at, the things that I put in front of my eyes. We live in a world that is so visually stunning. Everywhere we look, we are bombarded by millions, whether it's advertisements. There's stuff that comes before your eyes. You didn't even expect it. How many of you have been watching a, a game, and all of a sudden, Victoria, they're selling bras? I just want to watch football. You know what I mean? It's like, where does, I didn't even see this coming. There's, you've got to make some decisions ahead of time about how you're going to respond to the things that get set before your eyes. When David said, I'm not going to set any vile thing before my eyes, he's, not, he's like, listen, you can't change everything that comes in front of you, but you can make some decisions about what you intentionally put yourself in front of. Say, God, protect our hearts from things that, images and ideas and stuff that gets put in front of our eyes that, that doesn't belong. But for Pete's sake, do yourself a favor and don't make decisions to intentionally put yourself in front of stuff that's going to hurt you. So he said, I'm not going to set anything in front of my eyes. I, I acknowledge that it makes a difference. And then he says, the deeds of faithless men I hate. They will not cling to me. Men of a perverse heart shall be far from me. I will have nothing to do with evil. So well, this sounds like, you know, I'm going to isolate myself from, from everyone who's evil and everything that's evil. I'm going to set myself off in a cave somewhere and I'm going to sit there and just meditate on Jesus 24-7. And that's not what he is saying. What he is saying is, listen, when you have influences in your life, when you surround yourself with faithless people, evil images and vile images and e people with evil intent, that is going to seep into your behaviors and your thinking and your mind. There's a reason why God says don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, even much so as you see the days approaching. You need to surround yourself with people that are going to be encouraging, that are going to be challenging you to grow in Christ. Because the more you do, the more you grow. The more you, guys, it makes sense, right? This is not rocket science. This is not, this is not a doctoral level theology. Surround yourself with faithful people. He says a phrase there. Now, I know Christians, you're not, we're not supposed to hate, right? But listen to what he says. The deeds of faithless men, not the faithless men, but the deeds of faithless men, I hate. Why does he hate them? Because he sees how destructive they can be. He sees how, how much damage that they can bring into the world and into people's lives. He says, I hate that. And I'm not going to let them cling to me. I'm not going to let that stuff become part of my life. I hate the effect of faithless people. And he's like, I don't, I don't want them near me. I don't want them in my sphere of influence. I want a barrier between me and faithful people and people of a perverse heart. And it, I don't want them, any of that stuff clinging on me. He says, verse 5, whoever slanders his neighbor in secret, him will I put to silence. There, um, the, thing, the thing about slander and how we talk about each other or to each other, it's a pretty important decision. What David here makes as a conscious choice is that when, when somebody comes to me and they're trash talking or talking down or giving me information about somebody else, I, I want to... I 
want to shut it down. I want to make that quiet. And it's hard to do because somebody will come to you and they'll say, you know what I heard? Well, let me tell you something. And you're going to like, well, I kind of want to know. I, mean, I want to feel special. I want to hear what you have to say. And then I'll decide whether or not it was okay. We need to do a little better in, in love being able to say, um, I, don't, I don't want to hear any of that and you shouldn't be saying it. And you're like, and then you watch, you do that a few times. Anybody ever do that to somebody? You do that if somebody's coming to you and they're going to they're gonna try to say a bunch of information about somebody and, and tear them down and rip them apart. And then you say to them, I don't want to hear it. Um, that person in, 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 in matters. And if you have an issue, we need to go to them and, and talk to them about it. If, if you do that to somebody, Duck. Can I just be honest? I've, I've done this before. I've gotten caught, not necessarily slandering, but I've gotten caught up wh where I'm, I'm, I'm maybe talking, saying something about somebody. And then I have to be like, this, th this is not, it's not comfortable being told that, time out, what are you doing talking about this person? And you don't always even intend it. It's just easy for us to get into that habit. It's very difficult to rewire ourselves that if you have an issue with somebody, to go to them directly. If you have a concern about something, to go to that person. If somebody's hurt you or harmed you or offended you, go to those people. If they don't respond to that or, or you, you can't find your way, then, then bring somebody with you and, and try to deal with that, especially if it's re involving some kind of sinful behavior. But what happens is we tend to, we're not sure about our feelings and our things, so we'll grab somebody on the side and let me tell you about this person and what they did, and I, I want to hear what you had to think, and then you feel justified, and maybe you don't even go to the person to make it right. And now you've brought somebody else in on, on your opinions of, of, of another person, and they never got the chance to defend themselves, to explain, you might have been wrong. And now you've influenced somebody else's opinion of this person, and they didn't even have the chance to defend themselves. And so David's like, you know what? I, I don't want to be part of slander. I don't want to be part of, of, of that whole cycle of things. I want to be somebody, listen, you're carrying two buckets. You got one full of gasoline and one's full of water. When somebody comes to you and they want to start a fire, or maybe they've got a torch, and they want, to, they want to let you know how terrible somebody is and what they've all done. You've got a choice, simple choice. You're either going to put gasoline on that fire or you're going to put a bucket of water on it. Simple as that. You're either going to say, this stop, not on there. I'm not interested. Or you're going to say, Get, tell me more. Oh, yeah, well, I heard this. Let me tell you about somebody else. You see what I mean? How many of you have ever been hurt by this? Somebody said something about you to somebody else somewhere else? Come on. Now nah, you're all lying. Yeah, we've been, come on, we've been there. It doesn't feel good. It hurts. Let's not hurt each other like that. Let, let's be a place where when we have stuff, we can talk to each other. Um, but we've got to build trust up for that to happen. So here's the thing. He's like, whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, heart him will I not endure. Um, haughty and pride. We, have a, we live in a world where pride and individualism is so glorified that it's sometimes hard to notice it as something that is um, odd. What's remarkable is that a person of true humility becomes the most rarest form of of righteousness that most of us have ever experienced. But he says, I, I, want, I want to surround myself with people who are seeking humility, who are seeking to put others first, who are seeking to put the needs of others. You know how you do that? You start to be one of those people, and it's weird. You'll, you'll see how all of a sudden out of the world work, A, your actions begin to inspire that in, in other people. 
If you, if you start to live your life that, that's not focused on your needs and what you want, pouring yourself into others, lifting them up, encouraging other people, that begins to spread. It's infectious, just like, like gout. I don't know, is that gout is infectious? I don't know if that's true. It is. When, when, you, when you start to be a person who puts others first as a practice, other people around you will begin to take that example. You were wired by God for this kind of behavior. He says I, he made you for his purpose to glorify him. And you glorify him when you serve others, when you are about his work in this world. It's not about you. Make your life about, if you, if you make it about you, your life will always be unfulfilling. No matter how much you have, no matter how much you pour in it, there's a, there's a hole in that bucket. You'll never be enough. It'll ne you'll never be satisfied. When you start to give to others, you can't pour it out fast enough. You guys, this is a secret to Christian joy. And, and this is what he's saying. I want to be this kind of person who is humble. It says, my eyes will be on the faithful in the land. They that dwell with me, he whose walk is blameless will minister to me. Verse 7, no one who practices deceit will dwell in my house. No one who speaks falsely will stand in my presence. Again, he's saying, who, what's your influence? What are you focusing on? What are you putting in front of your eyes? You see the practical nature? What are you looking at? Who is around you? Where is your sphere of influence? What are the messages that you are, you are listening to? Where are they coming from? What is their heart? Is it prideful? Is it, is it vile? Is it sinful? Because if you have vile, sinful, prideful stuff that's around you and those messages and it's in, your, it's in front of your eyes, guess what's going to happen? That's what you're going to turn into. So he's saying, I want to surround myself with faithful people, with people who sing the praises of God. I want to surround myself with people who are trustworthy and humble. You guys, is this catching? I want to be that kind of person. Verse 8, he says, every morning I will put to silence all the wicked in the land. I will cut off every evildoer from the city of the Lord. You guys, David... You remember the story of how he slays Goliath in that field with the slingshot and a few stones. And, and we've told this story so many times here through the Psalms because it relates in so many ways to illustrate what he's talking about here. You've got this giant just talking trash to the nation of Israel, God's chosen people who are on the other side cowering in fear, afraid to step forward and take on this giant. That's the scene. This young boy, David, this little shepherd, comes into this scene. He's like, what are you guys doing? You are God's people. This guy's talking trash. Go shut him up. Uh, you can shut him up. He's like, okay. He gets it. He goes out there. And he takes care of business. Not, because, not in his might, not in his strength, but because the Lord was with him. So when he's saying things, I will shut off. I will silence the wicked. We live in a world where w the, they are increasingly talking trash about God's church. And they have every right to. Because we've blown it. We've huddled ourselves in the backfield somewhere, scared to step forward, scared to be the, the people of God that he's called us to be. And we sit there shaking and shivering while the world stands there and talks trash about how incapable we are, how impotent we are, how irrelevant we are, how useless we are, and we just take it in and we're like, I wish somebody would fight for us. And God says, I'm calling you to silence the wicked. How do you silence the wicked? Well, don't start hitting people with rocks. You silence them by stepping forward in obedience, trusting God in the direction that he's leading you to sing his praises. Be bold. Step forward. Begin to live a life that's different than the rest of the world. Be humble. 
Be faithful. Surround yourself with those who are humble and faithful and serve one another and serve and reach out to the world in kind and loving and generous ways, encouraging one another, building each other. And you begin to see how the, the, all the claims that the wicked have against the church begin to fall one at a time as we live the life that God has called us to live. We've got to be honest. The reason why a lot of the world doesn't want anything to do with the church is because we have failed to be the people of the church. So it starts with a step. Make a decision to praise the Lord each day. Psalm 101 teaches us some basic principles. I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes as we, uh, the worship team is going to come up here and close us in a song. And as we leave here today, nobody said this was easy. No, nobody said that this was just going to be Easy, but it doesn't mean it's not simple. Make some conscious decisions. Be intentional about the stuff you look at, listen to, surround yourself with, and the people that you're with. Make a conscious decision about the kind of person that you're going to be. Are you going to be humble? Are you going to be prideful? Are you going to be faithful? Or are you going to be wishy-washy on everything you do? Are you going to be silencing the wicked, or are you just going to shiver in fear, unwilling to step forward and be used by God to make a difference in the world. There are some simple things, guys. As you go back through this, take this psalm home with you. Begin to read it. Begin to meditate on this. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you on things that He'd like to work with you about. Say, God, what is in this for me? What is... What are you trying to say to me through this? How can I respond? Begin to make your own I will statements. You know what? I will praise the Lord. I, I will talk to someone at work about Jesus. I will be an encouragement to someone else. I will be a good witness in, in front of my family at home. I will make a, di make a change in some of the things that I watch or listen to. I will. You guys, you see these things? Rewrite this psalm in your own words. Make, do, if you've got a piece of paper, put this Psalm 101 there at the top. Go through there and put in your own words as you pray and listen to God things that He is asking you to make a, a, a decision in obedience about. And write it down. Say, I will. And say, God, help me here. When will you come to me, Lord? I can't do this on my own. I need your help. Come, come close to me and help me do this. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this beautiful day that we have and this weekend that we have to celebrate with our families and friends and Lord, I just pray that you would uh, keep us all safe, watch over us in our, in our communities. Lord, help us to find ways to, to reach people for, for the kingdom of God, for Christ. Help us to be the examples in the world that you want us to be. Uh, you know many of us here are, are far from blameless. But Lord, help us through, the, through your grace and the work of your Holy Spirit to grow, to begin to learn, to begin to to be transformed by your power and your strength for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you guys stand with me together as we sing?